Hi, everybody. My name is Jesse Randall. I'm the founder and CEO of Sweater. We're your host here at Founder Saga, and we're excited to be able to bring you the stories of founders who have really been through the ringer. Um, you know, our whole objective is to tell stories of what it's like to be in the trenches to get that company that you're working on, uh, you know, from the back of the napkin, truly out into market and getting through, um, you know, either bootstrapping it up or finding outside financing partners that can get you there. And really what founders like, like Brett Larson here have done to be able to survive through that period and eventually find, you know, the success that's definitely sitting on the table for you visit right now. So Brett, I'm excited to have you, you know, this is a special one for me. I've known you for a long time. It's great. It's great to connect. It's it's been a while. No one else will know this, but I actually reported to Jesse in a previous life. He was my boss. So <laughs> I think I have everything everything I we've accomplished today is thanks to you. <laughs> I am I am not taking credit for that. I probably should have been working under you. Let's let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it is fun. Like, I mean, a little bit of history for those who are listening. Um, Brett and I go way back. I mean, probably it's like eight years ago, right, that, uh, that we first started working together. And, um, you know, if I can tell a story, I still remember being so impressed by you because you had built a company all on your own and you were selling and shipping Arizona oranges to people, Christmas oranges. And I still remember that I was like, that's amazing that he figured out how to make that whole thing work. So anyways, I just remember being so impressed because you had actually built something. And, you know, compared to everyone else we were working with that had kind of peripherally worked on other people's stuff, you started something from dead scratch. And you were, in my eyes, like you were a true entrepreneur. You had that entrepreneur built into you. Um, and of course, you built up from selling oranges to doing what you're doing now. I don't know if you, you wanted me to tell that story, but from day one that I met yeah. you, I knew you were a real entrepreneur. That's super nice of you. It was, it was uh we trip our way into different things, but that was, that was a fun, interesting project. So. <laughs> well, let's, um, let's, let's dive into this. Okay. So this is what I, I typically like to do. Um, you know, most people probably aren't going to be familiar with eVisit. So let's start with you kind of giving us the quick pitch. I mean, let's have you tell everybody, you know, eVisit's purpose. We don't need to get into the origin stories yet, but just like, what are you now? If you're talking sure. to an investor, what is eVisit? You know, what's kind of your reach and scope? Um, you know, how do you measure your, your impact on the world? whatever you feel comfortable sharing. Yeah, absolutely. So at eVisit, we're an enterprise-wide virtual care platform. Uh, we focus, our target customers are enterprise health systems. So most most consumers will never know they're using eVisit, but at, at the end of the day, we've architected a platform that enables healthcare workflows to be digitized and it, and they, they all lead to a culmination in care. And the care occurs through two-way video. I think that categorically at a very high level, it's telehealth. But I think when a lot of people hear telehealth, they think two-way video, and that's a component of it. But we built workflows to accommodate all the things around care um, to make to enable large health systems to to position themselves and accelerate their virtual care strategy, and uh, and really compete effectively against like the large incumbents that have their own provider networks. So like we're helping the largest health systems in the country, Banner, Texas Health, Concentra, Envision. Uh, compete with Teladoc and Amwell by by enabling their own staff virtually versus versus uh, competing with the health plan solutions. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Um, I remember the first time you pitched this to me. Um, I, I still remember we we went on a drive and I think we went to Cafe Rio, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Remember it, was <laughs> it was very romantic. That's right. And I, I remember you saying, "Hey, I've got this." Uh, you know, I've got this URL you visit and I feel like I have an idea for what to do with it. And I remember you telling me all about it. Um, it it's, it's amazing there. So before we go back all the way into that story, uh, you know, um, you mentioned some of the big clients you work for. I mean, how else, like what other metrics do you use to kind of, you know, express your impact in the world? I mean, is it like number of visits or like, how do you, how do you kind of measure it? Yeah, it's, it's number of encounters facilitated. So, you know, we enable the connections. We don't, we don't, provide the services of like the medical care. And so it really is if you think about, you know, lean analytics approach, our num one metric that matters is today it's e-visits. You know, as, as we look at mm -hmm. expansion and the evolution of the product roadmap, those interactions begin to shift and evolve a little bit. Um, but today, you know, our, the core impact we have is, is connecting providers with their patients and patients with their providers um, through the platform. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. So let's let's jump back and talk about that napkin a little bit more then, right? I mean, like my encounter with you as you were working on that was just, you know, a quick brush. Obviously, it was in your head a lot more than what you were talking to me. So 
you know, describe that, that first, that first napkin, you know, I mean, what is it, is what you originally envisioned what you've been able to build today? Uh, it's, it's definitely evolved. Um, but at the core, it really, it really is, uh, which I think is, you know, you have to kind of dodge and weave as you, as you grow up. Um, but the, you know, the, the core, the core idea came, I was, I, you know, just after selling that first business that you mentioned, I knew I wanted to do it again. I there were like in the learnings I had there was I didn't want to do anything where there was physical inventory involved. I didn't want to have to deal with supply chain. I wanted to be able to source and fulfill my product immediately. And I, you know, we had healthy margins in that e-commerce business, but they weren't they weren't to the point where the business wasn't at the point where I could afford to hire, you know, I had the margins to hire people who who to grow myself, right? Like to, to I was the bottleneck, and there, I've I've since realized that a lot of those things are self-imposed. Um, but at the time, I thought it was a, a mechanism of my capacity from a margin perspective. And so, as I narrowed down business models, I thought, you know, this software is this is circa 2012, 2013. I thought, you know, software as a service starts to look very compelling to solve both of those two issues. And um, I didn't know anything about software, so I, I coming out of my undergrad at ASU. I took a position with a company called Stat Doctors, and they were it was a tech enabled services company. So they had been building technology, um, but had you know almost the exact same business model as Teladoc. So they built this provider network, and they were taking this network and selling access to it uh, into large self funded companies and health plans with the whole value prop of today. Mm -hmm. Your employees and your members are going to the urgent care and ER because they can't get in to see their primary care doctor, and so you're spending. $1,500 versus the $80 you should be spending in primary care. And, you know, by this service, we'll give access, you'll reduce your healthcare costs. And what occurred to me, we weren't scaling the way I thought we should have been. Um, utilization, you know, if you go read Teladox 10K, pre-pandemic utilization is we were experiencing the same types of utilization, 3% of the member base, 6% of the member base on a good year, uh, which anyone in SAS knows that that's doesn't doesn't denote strong retention. And so that was the concern. And I was employee number six, low, um, just not there weren't we didn't have a product team at the time. So I went out and started doing product work with end user patients trying to figure out why were they not using and why what what could we do to make them use or to incent them or, or make it compelling to use. And at the same time, I hate bringing up names like this during during talking about your company because it sounds very buzzy, but Uber had started to gain traction from a black, word of mouth in the black car service, right? Like they, mm. and there was already a lot of noise from the taxi cab industry about what, what that was going to do to their industry. And they were trying to block mm. them, you know, from a government perspective and municipalities. And it occurred to me that at scale, telemedicine would do to healthcare what Uber did to transportation. Mm. And that the way that we were approaching it was actually was i won't say wrong but that i i believe that by disconnecting doctors from their patients outcomes would de degrade that it was actually yeah. dangerous what we were doing not intentionally we were trying to do the right thing and i think they still are um but it occurred to me what if what if the taxi cab industry had had technology to combat uber knocking at the door what would it look like today um and so that, that's what i went back and I, I i i just i chewed on that for a really long time and um, ultimately decided, you know, that I was going to do it. You know, I didn't see it as competitive to the business we were running because I was going to be selling to healthcare organizations and they were selling to health plans. And so I left, that's, I, I took a position at Tall Wave. Um, and in the, in the background, you know, an individual I'd met that doctors had the domain name. Um, and I thought, well, that's perfect. Like, so I, I, mm -hmm. I recruited him to join in the cause, um, and then, you know, just kind of along the way, found a CTO just because I, I have a marketing background. I don't have a technical background and um, who became my co-founder. And he's he's a rock star in healthcare and entertainment, and a few other areas that just had the perfect background. Um, but yeah, we, we so we, we did start out with the concept of let's build a platform that enables these these practices and health systems to e-commerceify themselves. Right. Like it, it do for them what Shopify did to the broader e-commerce market, um, but add video to it and really digitize the experience and, and make it more, more yeah. seamless. 
Yeah. So, I mean, like at the end of the day, I mean, you really just reverse the roles, right? And you said, instead of, you know, one person calling into a random network of doctors, you're just giving your doctor the ability to talk to you without you having to go to the office. Right. Yeah. I mean, kind of dumbing it down. Um, I mean, I, I still remember when you said that, I remember thinking that's brilliant, <laughs> you know? And um, so like the ability for you to have um, launched when you did, I mean, obviously this last year, I assume has been awesome for the business. Um, you know, and, and really been a pivotal moment. You can't buy timing, right? But you were prepared for it. Tried. Like, you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can talk more about that. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, you're obviously in a great place now and growing at a great trajectory. So uh, looking back though, you know, um, let, let's examine more of that early story. So you had a vision, right? And it sounds like you were able to kind of keep the core of that vision the same, right? Into growing into what you became today, right? In terms of the overall concept, no, no major pivots, no major changes from the overall North Star. So let's talk and, and examine about like between when you really started this thing um, and when you got true outside funding, about how long was that period of time? Like, um, you know, like a major institutional round. Yeah, so, I mean, we we raised, and just give you a, a, a timeline of what, of, of how we, we progressed, you know, the first, we raised the first $50,000 on a note uh, that we ended up converting into equity, which I think, because later on, we we realized that it was, the risk that they took was, was, was big. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that the deal that, that subsequent note holders were getting was better. And so we were like, Hey, you took a lot more risk. We'll pay back the note if that's what you want, or we'll convert it to equity. And they chose the equity mm -hmm. version. So we raised about $2 million from friends and family. Um, in like a pre-seed, but our first institutional round came in, we closed it in December of 2016 and it was led by Kickstart Seed Fund out of Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're probably one of the most active or seed funds in the US maybe, but definitely in, in the Mountain West region. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Just amazing partners, but we, we took about, we took a $2 million seed round in 2016. Okay, gotcha. So what you started officially on this in 2014? Is that about right? So yeah, I, I left. I left Campus Logic, which is where I went after I I, I left. Oh, I forgot there. that you you were there. Yeah, I left Campus Logic in November of the end of November of 2014. My wife was nine months pregnant with our second child, and I figured if I could convince her to give up, you know, a great salary and benefits, this would all be very easy. Um, it's not been, but uh, but about. Yeah, November of 2014 was when I left to focus on it full time. Okay, yeah. Step one: get your wife in line. <laughs> no, I almost said in line. That sounds totally wrong. On board. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I mean, let's let's examine that period of time then. Those couple of years. So you you had a partner on board that was a doctor, right? Which is unique in, in the technology startup, right? Um, and he had the original domain, which kind of set off this whole pattern of thinking. So what was it like in the first you know year, like? I mean, you've got to build a product, um, you know, you've got to figure out and understand what your customers really want. You got to figure out a lot of different elements. So like, what was your starting point? What were you, what were you like, what was the checklist like? What were you trying to get through? Yeah, I mean, so originally, so the, I, I developed this concept as I, as I worked through the product stuff, um, you know, and I trying to think through the name, it became after I realized that the, this, this original, one of my, one of my partners had the name, I was like, oh, that's a perfect fit for what I want to do. Um, we, you know, I, I'm a marketer, so I, I focused, you know, some of the practices that we had developed at Tallwave, like I, I, I actually started, I started with the end user. So I started talking to my end customers, which was physicians. Um, and I called doctors that I had seen historically. And I just, I started walking through the concept and trying to get their thoughts on what, what would be compelling, what would the product need, you know? And, and frankly, I mean, one of the, if I could go back and do it all over again, um, we over-architected our MVP. I think a lot of groups do, but like we overthought it. I added more features than there needed to be. You know, we thought it needed e-prescribe and charting and all these other components right off the get-go. And in reality, if I could go back, I would have just created two-way video, like HIPAA compliant two-way video, and then evolved mm -hmm. the product from there. Um, but we, you know, it was, it was called November of 14. By that point, we had already set up, um, quite a bit. I had had, I had the MVP was already being developed. Uh, Miles was already on and had replaced the original developer. We'd found the website, we had a landing page up. We'd started doing some content marketing to get early awareness and traction and start to build a following and early signups. Um, 
we, you know, we had all the, all the logo and everything put together. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was by the time November 14 came and we, we were set to leave to kind of just focus on it. A lot of the core building blocks were in place. Ends mm -hmm. up, I don't think we launched the product commercially till May or April of the following year, 2015. Um, but knew that we'd gotten to an inflection point where it was just like, hey, if this is going to be real, someone needs to focus on it full time. Um, and right, you know, minor details, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it's interesting though. I mean, like just thinking tactically, you know, putting ourselves back in the shoes of entrepreneurs before they're you know successful. You were building this and getting the foundations in place while you were still working. Sounds like right. Yeah, nights and weekends. I, I learned an important yeah. lesson early on at Stat Doctors that for me, um, if I'm trying to do two things at once, I become really dissatisfied. And so I, I, I was very deliberate, you know, like my, I, I was employed and those employers were paying me for certain outcomes. And so, you know, my, my personal commitment was like, I wanted e it to be a thing, but I, but I, I made a commitment to these employers to give them what I told them mm -hmm. I'd give them. So I, I was, I tried to be very, very deliberate and when and where I worked on it, uh, which ended up being nights and weekends. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which could be harder, you know, to do than, than I think many people give it credit for, uh, especially when, you know, you do have that, I mean, call it, you know, the ethical line that you really want to make sure you're delivering on whoever you're working with. Um, you know, for you, uh, just, just out of curiosity, was this something that you were uh, transparent about? with your employers or was it just like, you know, I, I know in my heart that I'm doing what I'm supposed to and I'm delivering the value that they're paying me for and I'm just going to do this. Like, how did you see it? Uh, I, there was enough risk still involved that I, I didn't like go into a job interview being like, Hey, I'm working on this side thing. So I'm going to be here until that takes off and then I'm out. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a lot of, of things to tick off between now and then. Uh, so I, I, I wasn't very, I wasn't transparent about that. I was working on it on the backside. At Tall Wave, I was a little bit more transparent, um, just because they were a potential funding source, at least so I thought. Uh, and so I, I really wanted them to grab a hold of it with me, and it just they were focused on a different side of their business. And so, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's fine. But it's interesting, you know. I mean, it's not like everyone just like quit your job and then go start working, right? You started working well before you ever left left your paid employment. Which is good. I mean, because kind of a theme that often comes out here is like, how do you survive, right? When you're pre-revenue and you're, you're putting all your resources in the company, how do you survive, you know, um, financially just as an individual? Um, so it's it's good to understand kind of how you went about that. So then you had a period of time, right, even after you left that you weren't generating revenue and that you were, you know, getting the product ready to go. It sounds like it was another six or eight months or something until you really were in market. Um, and even then, right, like most products, you're not getting paid much. So you know, what were you doing? If you don't mind divulging, you don't need to like you know, show me your personal P and L, but like, what was your mentality for surviving financially? How did you get through that period? When we, I mean, we sat down with, there was three of us originally. Um, and we sat down uh, and it really was a, was a question of opportunity cost. One of the, one of the original partners was a physician. And so his opportunity cost to leave his medical practice was, you know, like four to six hundred thousand dollars a year. I don't, know, I don't know exactly what kind of money he made. Mine was a lot less than that. And and you know my ability to go find another job was at that point in my career was was a lot easier than than this partner's. Um, you know he'd been with this practice for a long long time, and so uh, you know there's got to be an exchange of value. Um, and so we ultimately decided, you know, he was like, look, I'll, I'll cover your salary for the first six months. Let's go raise money from friends and family. We'll do that. And at six months, we both decided we'd stop and take a look at where things were at and whether or not, you know, at that point, could the company or the money we'd raised support my salary? And um, if not, that I'd need to go look for, for, for a job, um, you know, depending on how successful we could be at raising money and, and getting us to a point where, we're, so it was, it was a trade-off. We looked at the opportunity cost and ultimately decided that if someone was going to focus full-time, it needed to be me um, mm -hmm. just for that reason. Yeah. So, yeah. That, that, well, that, what a great partner to be able yeah, to yeah. support you as a group, right? I mean, that's really an interesting dichotomy, right? To be able to play off that. A lot of groups find themselves in that situation. It was, it was, you know, I, um, it was great. 
Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, just in, in in retrospect, if he hadn't been willing to do that or been an, unable to do it, do you think you still could have pulled it off? Um, yes. I mean, we started, we raised $2 million from 53 different people over the course of two years. So it would, have, it would have been a little more, it would have been a little more like, you know, your stomach's in your throat feeling. Um, but we, we would have, it would have, you know, we started raising money, I think in December of 2014, we brought in about a hundred thousand or so, maybe a little more than that in, in friends and family money. Um, mm -hmm. you know, my, my salary at the time was as little as I, as I could take and still sure. support my family. Um, and so we could have made ends meet, but it definitely made it easier. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Uh, so let's shift gears for a second and talk about the product. I know a little bit about the, the journey you took to get that initial product built. Um, but why don't you tell us kind of from ground zero, you knew you were going to do this. How did you go about doing it and funding it? Yeah. So, um, Again, a lot of a lot of the process was informed by just kind of a, a lean, lean approach, right? Like, um, the, so as I thought about it, it was first it was validating. Uh, I knew that I felt like it was really important that the user interface of the product was was very very consumer feeling, and that was supplemented by a lot of the thought leadership that Miles has brought um, after he joined in late 2014. But so I, I started out like pen and paper wireframing the the experience on graph paper, like screen by screen, diagramming an entire workflow, um, you know, and just literally drawing it out. And I actually, I connected with, there's a, there's a founder in town in Phoenix uh, who founded a company called WebPT, um, a guy named Brad Jenanga. Uh, him and his wife co-founded this company. And yeah, his, Brad and Heidi are awesome. There are, they're, they're such great supporters of, of the community here. Um, but the, his recommend it was, it was on his recommendation. He's like, look, when you build a house, you don't go build it and then decide to move lights and walls. And he's like, you do a blueprint and you get the blueprint exactly right. And then you build. And so based on his advice, when I went through and just wireframed the whole thing. And then I went, um, after I was pretty confident, I put wireframes in front of our end users and had them like literally pushing paper to move to the next screen and swapping things out. Uh, and then I found a designer. So I went on dribble uh dot com and just started looking at ui designers portfolios and trying to decide like who who had the approach and the skill set and the the aesthetic that we really liked and wanted mm -hmm. uh, and a guy um that had done work for like gopro and a few other groups and and got him to quote out what it would take to design however umpteen many screens we had yeah uh, and then you know worked back and forth with him to get like pixel perfect and then uh, and then I started looking for an engineer. And at the time, the languages that were in vogue on the, it was like Ruby and um, I'm trying to remember the name. It's, it ended up not getting as much traction as, as it, uh, from a front end perspective as, as the community thought it was going to. Uh, but I found someone who had that skill set, and I'd gone through a couple of different like freelance engineering websites and just mm -hmm. the costs were the markup was something that I'd, we just didn't have money or appetite for. And so I, I ended up uh, finding a way to scrape their, their backend database. Good job, um, Mr. Marketer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, just, just anyway, we found a group, a group, a, a, a good handset of people that had been vetted and, uh, and just reached out to them one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, one of them responded and, and interviewed a few and ended up, he ended up starting to work on the MVP. So I gave him the wireframes and he started building it out. Um, and then like as most engineering projects go, it takes twice as long as three times as expensive, but it got to a point where I just stopped, I started losing confidence that we were going to get where we needed to get in the time frame, which, and I was, I was complaining to a, my a family member about like, I just need to find someone who can, who's competent at this. And I think good engineers are a lot like good mechanics. If you find a good one, you, you don't take your car anywhere else. They yeah. do what they're going to do. They do it on time. And that's how I got introduced to miles. My brother-in-law had worked for him at another startup he had started and, uh, and miles, um, unbeknownst to me, had this incredible background in healthcare technology and entertainment and, and video, um, you know, like the perfect storm, just like a godsend. And, uh, and so I hired his engineering like boutique firm to work out the rest of the kinks. 
Mm -hmm. And along the way, you know, we had started pitching to accelerators and things like that. Um, and it became apparent, like we didn't have a CTO or, a, and, and so we asked Miles to step in as an interim CIO or CTO. And it was like, you heard him get up and present and you're like, holy crap, this guy can like, he knows technology, but he can also speak business. And I, so I started working on him to, to see what it would take to get him to come to join as a, as a, one of our co-founders. Oh, that's awesome. Well, what a, yeah, what a blessing to have somebody kind of fall into your lap like that. Uh, they're, they're tough to find. Um, so from that point, I mean, you were really able to, to accelerate. I mean, it's, so it was around then that you actually raised that outside funding. Um, yeah, we started the process. I think, you know, the first, the first check came from my, my father-in-law, which is, which is, uh, that was the initial 50,000 that got like the, by the way, for me, whenever I've started something, I've had to find there's a, there's an even ground of like putting myself in a situation where I cannot turn back. Like I'm financially in a position where I, I can't not do it, but not so far down the path that it would ruin me financially. Like, you know, that I have to like move my family out and into a van down by the river, right? Like that I could still support my family, but I just, I couldn't stomach losing the amount of money that we'd put out there. And so the first $50,000 came from uh, my father-in-law and his partner. And then my parents invested uh, the next, the next tranche. And then um, so my partner had some friends and family that started putting in money and it was just check by check. I mean, it was a pretty, pretty mm -hmm. long yeah. grind. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you said what 50 something investors on the cap table in those first couple of years. 53 over $2 million. So, I mean, they were like $25, $50,000 checks one at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Holy crap. That, that is intense. Um, I mean, obviously like you do what you have to do. I mean, there's it, that, I guess that's one of the appeals of venture, right. Is that you can get a single check or three checks or whatever, right. And just have it be done. Um, but you know, given the situation, like if, if you were talking to other founders that maybe were in the same, um, you know, the same boat that you were in, what would you, what would you say about managing that angel process? Um, uh, I, I think it was actually pretty valuable. If I look back, I, I think it forces you to be, to not be too haphazard about where you're investing those dollars, right? Like when you know that it's 25 here, 25 there, you know, you've, you, it, for me anyway, it forced us to be a lot more careful. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but I, you know, I think one, I think too many entrepreneurs think they should raise money. Two, I yeah. think that a lot of us think that that, that raising the money in and of itself is a milestone. It's not, it enables other milestones. Three, I think true success is not having to raise money. And there are, there are certain situations where you should, where the market's incredibly competitive, where it's a race to the top, where you have figured out your go to market. And there's a, there's a recurring machine there where you know that a dollar in equals three out in such and such time frame, um, And you can really scale this. But I, it, it, the other thing that I think is good about raising money is it's a forcing mechanism to think bigger. Um, you know, most any, any venture group that, that has any experience at all is not investing in a $20 million outcome. Like they're investing every single bet they make is to return the fund. And they know that seven out of 10 of them won't, right? That, that one or two might, and that the rest of them, you know, they're lucky if they get a base or two, two base hits, and then they're gonna write off a certain percentage. Um, but I, I would say, a lot of us initially, especially the first time, go out thinking, I've got a great product and an awesome idea. Put $2 million in or a million even. The reality is like, you're going to go out further and be a lot more credible if you can go out with a, I've got a great product, great idea, and here's all this massive early traction that's indicating to you that this is more of a sure thing than the other you know, 30 deals you're looking at. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, that's such a tough place to be as a founder, right? I just saw a post today on LinkedIn it was something effective, you know, if, if founders are really honest with themselves, when they say I need to raise money, it's usually so I can cover my cover myself, right? I need to get, I, I need somewhere to be able to survive, which is an interesting motivation. Um, you know, and for a lot of people, right, they, they may not have a, a father in law that can cut a $50,000 check to get things started, even though, as far as I understand it, a lot of that was going into building your product, you weren't taking, you know, salary out of that. Um, it's still like, I mean, to get that thing kickstarted and over the edge, it's so tempting to just say, well, I have to go raise money. Now, I understand the path that you went down is specific, right? And you had, you know, I mean, it, it's like uh, making cookies, you know, you can make, there's there's a thousand ways to make chocolate chip cookies, you know? So like you have your recipe that you just went through. 
But if you were, you know, talking to founders that maybe didn't have um, family or a, a you know, a, a co-founder that was able to give you some of the financial support that you had, what would be your suggestion for saying you shouldn't raise money, right? You need to make it through these stages. What would you tell them to do? I, I think there needs a lot of us try to like back into what's reasonable. You know, like I, I, I look, you look at the evolution of a lot of companies and you don't, you, you start with the end in mind, but having a very like deliberate stepwise direction to get there. Um, I think one of the most, you know, being self-aware and knowing where your skill set lies and where you need to supplement that, like there are ways I'm, I'm advising, a, another startup right now. And they're, you know, the, the founder is a sales, one of them was a salesperson. The other one's a finance guy. And they realized like, we, we either got to be able to afford to pay someone to build this or find someone who can join to build this. And so they recruited a CTO or a, a co-founder with a technical background who could actually do that. And they're all, they're all sweating in, um, you know, our jobs as founders, like at every point in the journey, like there are building anything is hard, like creating anything from nothing is difficult. It all starts with a concept and there are going to be a ton of, uh, boulders and brick walls and, you know, solid steel walls. And like your job as a founder is to figure out how to get through it, either like directly through it or over it or under it or around it. And, you know, it's never linear. I mean, like you hear one of the, my, there's no way to not fix this, but you hear founders tell stories about the growth journey. And, and I, I think most of them are pretty transparent about the really tough stuff. And, and what you hear as a participant is you're like, oh, that's amazing. That's an incredible story. Like, and you just think they knew it was going to work out and you never do, right? There have been multiple near death experiences at eVisit where like, I literally wasn't sure if I needed to start, like if I was going to have to look for a job in the next six months, um, you know, we're past that now, but there were times where, and, and people will hear me tell that story and be like, yeah, but you just knew, like, look at where you are now. You knew it was going to work out. And you're like, no, you don't, you don't. And so it's, I mean, it takes an incredible amount of, uh, it's, it's probably ignorance more than anything else where you're just like this undying belief that you can figure it out, that it, you can get there, that there's, you know, it's, it's through the next wall that you hit that upward trajectory. And it's also, you know, it's just, it's not linear and, and, yeah. you know, it's lonely and it's scary and it's hard, but. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and so much of that, I mean, it's not even, I mean, people focus on the financial hardship, you know, of trying to get through it. But I mean, most of what you're describing is really in your head, in your heart, right? Yeah. So like, I mean, what do, so what do you do to manage that? I mean, because that's rough. I mean, looking ahead and, and not knowing if, if you're going to have to, you know, kind of bury your child and go and start over, so to speak, right? And go back to working for the man. I mean, th those are tough things to confront and you can't help but have them going through your mind. It, it's terrifying. I, I, mean, I remember the early days at eVisit, you know, Greg Scoresby, who's the the founder of campus logic i think you maybe have had him had him on yeah 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 Greg's he, gave awesome. us, he gave us and i worked for greg but he gave us free office space for a year and it was our our it was in a it was in their loft it was up this set of staircases 653 square feet and i i remember you know there were every morning stopping at the bottom of the staircases and we had three maybe four or five at the, at the at before we moved out it was like 12 people up there and 600 square feet um <laughs> We like to the point of sitting on each other's laps, which we never did. It's a massive HR issue. Uh, <laughs> but like stopping at the bottom of the stairs, you know, and and like having to take a deep breath and be like, okay, like everyone's looking at me to understand whether or not I believe this is going to work out. And today I don't know, right? Like, and so I'd stop at the bottom of the stairs, keys in my hand, and and like, okay, it's going to work out. And I'd go upstairs and and put on you know a brave face, and like we'd we were figuring it out. We had little milestones we were reaching for. Um, but like my personal coping, you know, I, I, you've got to find space to put first things first. And that's really hard to do. Like I, I, when we take, when we've taken dollars from individuals or institutions, I, I take it super personally, like that you're, while they need to understand the risk, I've also committed to do everything I can to make sure there's a return. And um, that can feel super lonely because there's, there's, that you just feel super lonely. Uh, and so, but I, I've also learned that uh, there's certain things that you, that don't recover. Like if you, if you disregard them, 
And so for me, it was always putting my family first, like the relationship I have with my wife, the relationship I, I have or want with my children. Um, for me, it was success at the end of something like this. It never would have been successful if at the end of it, I didn't have, my children didn't know who I was and I didn't know who they were at a very personal level. And so, you know, I made it a goal that unless I was out of town that I, I was able to be home for dinner and, and play time and, you know, bath and bed and story time. Like those were important mechanisms for me, which helped keep me grounded and recognizing like there's, this is important. What we're doing at Eva's is incredibly important, but, but what I'm, what am I doing it for? And it was, you know, it's for the security of my family. Um, I, I, when I, we started a visit from like November to April or May, I put on like 40 pounds, just stress eating at the end of the night, going home, sitting in front of Netflix and like just working through the night or like, and just binging on ice cream. Uh, and like, so I started I, I, the day I stepped on the scale and realized that I was like, Oh my gosh, this is unacceptable. So I hired a personal trainer, which I couldn't, you know, I could barely afford, but I recognized that like that outlet and making sure that my personal health there that is keeping that in check. There's like routines and habits that I've created that have given me space like mentally and emotionally and relationally that, that um, have helped me manage through it. And I, you know, those relationships are key, making sure that they're ones mm -hmm. of trust. And I'm actually surprised that more institutional investors don't, don't do diligence on a founder's uh, and their partner's relation, like their, their life partner, their, whether, you know, their spouse or their significant other's relationship, because mm -hmm. if it weren't for Brie and like the support system she created and provided to me, I don't like, if things aren't right at home, you can't be fully there at work. And so that's been, that's mm -hmm. been a huge component for me. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I feel absolutely the same way about my wife and, and about my, my kids, right? Like I was just looking at pictures, like I see these pictures behind me. It's only two years ago. Like I've got a kid that's about to become a teenager and it, it, it's just, it's like, <laughs> oh my gosh, that was, that was two years ago. And I just think two more, like he's only gonna be around for like four or five more years and he's literally not going to live here anymore. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I put myself in sweater context and it's like, geez, I'm looking at like a 10 year horizon here. And I'm like, half my kids will be out of the house. And it's, it's crazy to think like, okay, so I get one shot. And I, I totally agree with you, you know, like I can't get those years back and putting first things first. I like how, you know, how you reemphasize that. It's so incredibly important. Um, yeah, that's really good. Thank you for sharing that. I know it's kind of personal. Um, well, the way that I like, this has been awesome. Thank you for, for opening up and sharing so much. Um, you know, the way that I, I usually like to end these is to just kind of hand you the mic and, you know, imagine yourself in front of an audience of, you know, 1500 entrepreneurs who are saying, you know, I'm either in the trenches and I'm, you know, a few steps back from where you were maybe three years ago, or I'm sitting on the fence deciding whether or not I want to do this. What would you tell them? Uh, if you're sitting on the fence, you, I mean, you've, when you decide to do it, you've got to be all in, like, regardless, like, again, there are a few things that you've got that based on your life priorities, you, uh, you need to decide aren't worth the sacrifice. But other than that, you owe it to the people you're hiring, to the people you're taking money from, to the people you're doing it for, to your customers, to make it work. Um, this, like the, the journey, even if you have co-founders, like what, what you're doing when you sit in a, I'll say specifically, I think probably any CEO, when you sit in a founder CEO seat, it's, it's incredibly lonely. Uh, and not a lot of founders end up talking about that. And, um, for me, it helped, you know, I, I actually <laughs> back to our tall wave days. I remember you had a quote on your, on your cubicle wall that said something like entrepreneurs work like no one else will, so they can live like no one else can. And uh, for me, I had a realization one day, I, I, I kept, you know, internal whining to myself, like, why is this so lonely? No one understands. This is so hard. This is, and it is, it's intended to be, if it wasn't, everyone would do it. Um, and it doesn't always work out. But I, it occurred to me that, you know, that I was, I was so concerned with being alone when every decision I'd made up until that point put me in a category of one, like it put me in a, in a lonely place and I had chosen it. And as soon as I like the light switch for me that I was like, oh, uh, this is all self-inflicted. This is your decision. And if you're successful, if this outcome, if you get to where you're aiming, you are going to be alone. Like not many people get to get to that point of a successful exit of an organization. Um, you know, it's less than, I think, 3% of companies in the US ever exceed a million dollars in revenue. Like that's a very select few. Um, 
and and that made it all feel a little bit better. But I, I think the other thing is it doesn't have to be lonely. You know, building building a network of you know I I was fortunate that I had a board that was supportive of me hiring an executive coach, like to help me become a better CEO, to help me become just a better human being, um, to to like to to knock off some of the rough edges, to just to be able to take a closer look in the mirror. Um, and, uh, you know, so it, it's lonely. You got to figure out how to navigate through that, but it doesn't have to be lonely. Whether you're building a network of, of fellow founders and CEOs who are in the same boat as you. Um, for me, I, my, I'd heard of some advice early on that, you know, if, if you want to become something or someone spend time with people who've already become that or who've achieved that. Mm -hmm. And so it's you know deliberately putting people around you, and I've taken that with our team internally. Like I, I feel like we're we're successful. Uh, we are more successful when we hire when we hire people who are better than we are, and that's intimidating because I think as a young founder, I always felt like I needed to know more than the people around me. And when I came to the realization that I didn't and I shouldn't, and that when we would scale, when we could actually, when I actually started hiring people who were who were better equipped to handle these issues it was really freeing and it, it allowed me to let go and, and give the vision away and let people come in and, and leave their fingerprints on, on what it is we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. I, I love that because I've gone through the same thing personally, just, you know, coming to the realization that you need to surround yourself with people that are, I mean, in, in many respects, better and more knowledgeable than you. Right. Uh, and that that is freeing, you know, and that it shouldn't be, um, I think it's really easy to step back and be threatened by that you know, in a way, like, it, it's kind of like core humanity, like be threatened, you know. Um, but at, at the end of the day, that's how you build an exceptional business. If everyone is just like your equivalent or less, you're not going to get very far. I mean, we're all so flawed anyway, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I love that. I, I love it. Um, well, thank you, Brett. This has been awesome. Um, you know, for everyone that's, that's in here listening to this one, uh, Brett's been through one heck of a path and you're building a great company. I'm excited to continue to watch your, uh, watch your progress. And uh, I think that you're going to, I think you're going to get that goal, Brett. I'm excited to watch you uh, pull it across the finish line. Well, appreciate you. Appreciate all you've done to support. It's, it's exciting to, it's uh, those, that journey's important, like for all of us, as we navigate through it, like you learn important things about yourself um, that like help you become get there right like to help you learn and how to navigate and get and, and achieve the ultimate desired outcome i think yeah yeah right and i mean half half the benefits of the journey right yeah that's, that's what right. i'm told <laughs> <laughs> yeah one day you'll, you'll, you'll be the wise yeah you'll be the wise sage sitting on a mountain one day saying it's all about the journey right right now you're like what are you talking about <laughs> this is hard yeah uh, but thank you everyone uh and uh we'll, we'll have you tune in again next time